welcome back. So, now we take up the Fermi Dirac situation, Fermi Dirac scenario. As you know, Klein Gordon uh, equation deals with particles, scalar particles, that is, particles having no sp spin and uh, massive, uh, they have non zero masses. Uh, now, we talk about Fermi Dirac particles uh, which have uh, uh, spin, uh, spin half particles and which are usually called fermionic particles. Uh, so, we shall develop this theory right from scratch and we shall work on to work on to the fermionic path integral that is our agenda for the current lecture. So, let us proceed. Now, for the fermionic fields they obey the anti commutation relations. Remember we, we are so far accustomed with the commutation relations. Now, we talk about anti commutation relations. Recall that commutation relations are given by if you have commutation brackets between A and B, these are two operators then they are equal the this is equal to A B minus B A. But when we talk about anti commutators, uh, we represent them by curly brackets A comma B, these are again operators remember, uh, they are called anti commuting operators and A B plus B A. So, in the case of fermionic fields, the, they obey the anti commutation relations phi x phi y at a given point in time is equal to 0. Indeed, uh, uh, you uh, may uh, also afford to omit the subscript x 0 equal to y 0, because this relation has to be met at all points of time. Now, now the important thing as I mentioned before uh, in the earlier lecture also, when we talk about the, the path integral or the generating functional for the full green functions, uh, which is usually the expression given in the red box in the middle of your slide. The phi's that appear here are classical numbers or C numbers, they are not operators. Uh, so, when we deal with the cor corresponding path integral or the corresponding generating functional in the context of fermionic fields or fermionic particles, uh, we need to replace them by fermionic or anti commuting variables, not anti commuting operators. And these anti commuting variables are called Grassmann variables. Uh, they were first uh, introduced into the literature by Grassmann through um, paper sometime probably in the in the 19th century uh, and uh, they have been extensively used for the management of uh, uh, fermionic uh, fields which obey in, uh, in the Pauli exclusion principle. We will see how uh, interesting uh, this uh, relation this uh, Grassmann variables naturally lead to the Pauli exclusion principle in fact. So, uh, we extend the functional uh, methods uh, to Fermi fields through the Grassmann anti commuting C numbers or anti commuting variables, remember not operators. The generators of an n dimensional Grassmann algebra obey this commutation relationship, anti commutation relationship, I am sorry, uh, obey this anti commutation relationship which is given in the red box here. Uh, and uh, as a corollary to this anti commutation relationship for i equal to j, it immediately follows that c i square is equal to 0 for i equal to 1, 2 up to n n dimensional algebra. So, this is given in the green box at the bottom of your slide, the generators of an n dimensional algebra obey. Uh, in general, for i unequal to j, they obey the relationship given in uh, red box and for i equal to j, they obey the relationship given in the green box here. Now, let us introduce the concept of Grassmann functions. Now, the important thing is the expansion of a Grassmann function, the polynomial sort of expansion uh, in of the Grassmann functions uh, contains only a finite number of terms. For example, in the context of the expansion of a function of two variables, function of two variables, we can have only an expansion of the form that is shown in the red box. Uh, uh, either first expa uh, expansion or the second expansion which is in fact the first expansion obtained uh, by reversing the order of 
the last term. Uh, you will uh, uh, immediately notice that any further expansion uh, vanishes because of the condition c i square equal to 0. For example, any uh, the next term would either involve c 1 square or c 2 square or uh, uh, and uh, both of them would vanish and therefore, our expansion of a, of a function of two Grassmann variables can comprise of only these four terms. Now, we introduce the concept of differentiation. Now, differentiation in the context of Grassmann variables or Grassmann functions or functions of anti commuting variables can take the form of two, two types. It can be left differentiation, it can also be right differentiation. Uh, usually, in the absence of explicit mention, it is assumed that the differentiation is left differentiation. So, let us start with left differentiation. If you are gi given a function of the form that is in the uh, in the red box here, which is what was there in the previous slide and which is in some sense the general function uh, of uh, two variables, um, then we define the left differentiation as uh, if you look at it the a 0 term is constant. So, it goes uh, differentiation of c 1 with respect to c 1 um, gives us 1. So, uh, uh, the differentiation of the second term with respect to c 1 gives us a 1. Uh, c 2 is independent assumed independent of c 1. So, the third term gives us 0 and c and the fourth term gives us a 3 c 2 a 3 c 2 the derivative of c 1 with respect to c 1 is 1. Now, and similarly if I want to work out this is the uh, derivative of f with respect to c 1 the left hand left derivative of f with respect to c 1. Let us now work out the left derivative of f with respect to c 2. For this purpose, we need to write the uh, write the last term in the form that is given in the second equation. Uh, plus a 3 c 1 c 2 needs to be written as minus a 3 c 2 c 1 using the anti commuting property. And then of course, we can uh, differentiate as we did in the earlier case and what we get is a 2 minus a 3 c 1. So, the results are tabulated here in the green box at the bottom of the slide. Similarly, we can define right differentiation for the purpose of right differentiation. Uh, for example, for the purpose of right differentiation with respect to c 1, we will need to write the the last term the fourth term in the reverse order and then do the differentiation from backwards uh, operating from the back to the front uh, we from from the right to the left and therefore we get a1 minus a3 c2 as the right derivative of f with respect to c1 now properties of the derivative properties of differentiation uh, you can clearly see that uh, the first derivative with respect to c 1 gives us a 1 plus a 3 c 2 we have done it just now. Uh, therefore, c 1 into the first de left derivative of f with respect to c 1 gives us a 1 c 1 plus a 3 c 1 c 2 and c 1 f on the other hand gives us a 0 c 1 if you can uh, if you multiply throughout by c 1 it gives us a 0 c 1 a 1 term vanishes because c 1 square is equal to 0 uh, plus a 2 c 1 c 2 you are multiplying by c 1 from the left and again the fourth term also vanishes. So, um, clearly we have the derivative of c 1 f with respect to c 1 gives us a 0 plus a 2 c 2 and that leads us to a very important relationship c 1 we have got this from the previous slides the expression in the red box and the blue box that is what we have derived in the previous slide and from this what we find is that the expression that we have gives us that c 1 into the derivative with respect to c 1 plus derivative with respect to c 1 c 1 is equal to 1 this is an operator identity this is a very important um, uh, relationship uh, connecting the differentiations uh, with respect to c1 with the uh, corresponding variables c1 in general what we have is derivatives 
anti commute among themselves. The anti commuter of C i with its own derivative is equal to 1, the anti commutator of C i with the derivative of any other generator is equal to 0, the anti commutator among generators is equal to 0, derivatives of generators is equal to 0. Now, we talk about Grassmann integration. Uh, for the purpose of Grassmann integ integration, we start with with the relations that the infinitesimals so d c i must ob obey the Grassmann uh, relations and must be Grassmann quantities. Therefore, we must have the relations that are given in the red box at the uh, in the middle of your slide. The anti commutator of c i with d c i will be 0 and will uh, anti commutator of c i with d c j will also be 0. In other words, if for all j equal to or unequal to i, the anti commutators vanish. And similarly, the anti commutators between d c i and d c j also vanish. Multiple integrals are interpreted as iterated in integrals as is uh, the case in uh, uh, in uh, usual uh, uh, calculus and we have integral of d c i d c 1 d c 2 f c 1 c 2 is equal to d c 1 integral d c 2 f c 1 c 2. Now, what are integral d c 1 that is very interesting uh, let us start with integral d c 1 square we write it as integral d c 1 integral d c 2 with with the condition that we shall put d c 1 equal to d c 2 at the end of our calculations. Uh, this is nothing but using the uh, anti commutator, uh, we can write this as d c 1 d c 2 integral in the, in the is using the property of multiple integrals. I can write it as integral d c 1 d c 2 that becomes integral d c 2 minus d c 2 d c 1 using the anti commutator and now I put d c 2 equal to d c 1. So, what I get is integral d c 1 minus integral d c 1 whole square. Let me retrace the steps integral this is important integral d c 1 square is equal to integral d c 1 integral d c 1 put c 1 put 1 equal to 2 uh, with the condition that we will replace it later. So, that becomes integral d c 1 integral d c 2 uh, and the, uh, because of the property of multiple integrals I can write it as integral d c 1 d c 2 uh, which I can uh, replace as integral d c 2 d c 1 uh, um, with the minus sign due to anti commutation and now I can write 2 equal to 1 and I get minus integral d c 1 square and, and this at the uh, therefore, I get integral d c 1 square is equal to minus integral d c 1 square uh, at the end of the day and that implies that integral d c 1 is equal to integral d c 2 is equal to 0. Since, there is no other scale uh, no other scale to Grassmann variables we choose we choose integral d c 1 c 1 equal to 1 and so on integral d c 2 c 2 equal to 1 and so on. Now, we move to the n dimensional case in the n dimensional case what we what we have is uh, on uh, in analogy with what I have said earlier uh, we and get the relations integral d c 1 is equal to 0 d c i is equal to 0 now where i is equal to 1 2 3 up to n and integral d c i into c i is equal to 1 uh, for every i uh, between uh, including and between 0 to uh, sorry 1 to n. Now, integration of f c 1 c 2 let us see what we get integration of f c 1 c 2. Remember what is f? f is equal to a 0 plus a 1 c 1 plus a 2 c 2 plus a 3 c 1 c 2 that is the definition of f c 1 c 2. So, what we get is integral d c 1 of f integral of f d c 1 in other words uh, is equal to integral d c 1 into a 0 plus a 1 c 1 plus a 2 c 2 plus a 3 c 1 c 2 this is equal to a 0 integral d c 1 plus uh, the uh, d c 1 distributes over all, all these terms uh, 
uh, of the function f and now we use the property uh, d integral d c 1 is equal to 0, integral c 1 d c 1 is equal to 1, integral d c 1 in the third term is also 0, integral d c 1 c 1 in the fourth term is 1. So, what we are left with is a 1 plus a 3 c 2. And now, recall that the derivative of f with respect to c 1 was also a 1 plus a 3 c 2. So, at, at least as far as f c 1 c 2 is concerned, the, a general function of two Grassmann variables integration and differentiation gave us the same result. Now, we come to integration of exponentials. Let eta and eta bar be independent complex Grassmann quantities eta and eta bar be independent complex Grassmann quantities. So, we have integral d eta is equal to 0, integral d eta bar is equal to 0 and d eta integral d eta in uh, eta is equal to 1, integral d eta bar eta bar is equal to 1, but eta square is equal to eta bar square is equal to 0. Therefore, we have e to the power minus eta bar eta is equal to 1 minus eta bar eta. The, the remaining terms will go, will be 0 because of the doubling of or the squaring of either eta or eta bar. So, what we have is e to the power minus eta bar eta is equal to 1 minus eta bar eta and therefore, the integral of d eta bar d eta e to the power minus eta bar eta is equal to integral d eta bar d eta minus d eta bar d eta eta bar eta. The first term is clearly 0 and the second term is clearly 1. So, what we have is the integral of e to the power minus eta bar eta with respect to eta bar and eta is equal to 1. So, integration in higher dimension, we now generalize this formula to higher dimensions. Let us consider the two dimensional case. We write eta as vector eta 1 eta 2 and eta bar as the vector eta bar 1 eta bar 2, column vector eta, eta 1 eta 2 and the column vector eta 1 bar eta 2 bar. The expression eta bar eta is essentially eta bar transpose eta is and it gives us eta 1 bar eta plus eta 2 bar eta simple matrix multiplication and eta bar eta square is equal to eta bar eta 1 into eta bar eta 2 multiplied by the same expression again. And uh, when we simplify this expression, uh, the first term and the fourth term vanish and we are left with eta 1 eta 1 bar eta into eta 2 bar eta and the cross terms are there and uh, we have eta 2 bar eta 2 and uh, eta 1 bar eta 1 and these two terms because of the anti commutators uh, operating twice uh, they add to each other and we have 2 eta 1 bar eta 1 eta 2 bar eta 2 because as you can see the anti commutator operates twice because of the squaring and the higher powers are obviously 0. Therefore, what do we have for the e uh, for the exponential minus eta bar eta is equal to 1 minus eta 1 bar eta plus eta 2 bar eta plus 1 by 2 into 2 eta 1 bar eta eta 2 bar eta. Now, we when we apply the integration rules that we have defined earlier and that is eta integral d eta bar d eta bar d eta is equal to and, and, and we use this expression d eta bar d eta is equal to d eta 1 d eta 1 d eta 2 bar d eta 2. What we see that is when we integrate this expression, we have eta 1 bar eta 2 
d eta 1 bar d eta 2 bar d eta 1 d eta 2 this is uh, uh, clear and then we have when we do the integration when we do this integration clearly the first term one term vanishes the second term also vanishes the third term also vanishes and what we are left with is the fourth term and the fourth term gives us one only so out of these four terms when i integrate this with respect to this is four these four uh, infinitesimals uh, the first term vanishes because d eta 1 is integral d eta 1 is 0 and d eta 2 is so the whole thing goes and d eta 1 bar d eta 1 will take out two terms d eta 1 bar into eta 1 will be 1 d eta 2 bar into eta 2 uh, will be 1 uh, I am sorry d eta 1 bar with d eta 1 bar will be 1 eta 1 bar with d eta 1 bar will be 1, uh, eta 1 with d eta 1 will be 1, but the other two terms will be will be 0. So, again it is 0, the third term similarly will be 0, eta 2 bar with d eta 2 bar will be 1, eta 2 with d eta 2 will be 1, but the other two terms will be 0. So, again it will be 0 and the only term left is the fourth term which eta 1 bar will join d eta 1 bar give, you, give us 1, eta 1 will join d eta 1 give us 1, eta 2 bar will join d eta 2 give us 1 and eta 2 will join d eta 2 and give us 1. So, the net result will be 1 here again as in the one dimensional case. Now, change of variables, what happens when you change variables? Let us say eta is equal to e, uh, the column vector eta 1 eta 2 and this is equal to m into alpha where m is a matrix given by the expression in the red box here m 1 1 m 1 2 m 2 1 m 2 2 and uh, then alpha 1 alpha 2. So, this is the change envisaged in other words the change envisaged is eta 1 goes to m 1 1 alpha 1 plus m 1 2 alpha 2 and eta 2 goes to m 2 1 alpha 1 plus m 2 2 alpha 2 and eta similarly, similarly it eta bar goes to n alpha bar where n is another similar matrix n is n 1 1 n 1 2 n 2 1 and n 2 2. So, what we have is eta 1 eta 2 is equal to m the expression that is given in the red box here uh, and <coughs> if you simplify this expression uh, again alpha 1 into alpha 1 gives us alpha 1 square uh, which is 1 uh, alpha 1 into uh, alpha 1 gives us alpha 1 square which is 0 uh, alpha 1 into alpha 2 is uh, retained and similarly alpha 2 into alpha 1 is retained that is nothing but minus alpha 1 uh, into alpha 2 and uh, alpha 2 into alpha 2 is again 0 alpha 2 square is 0. So, what we end up with here is determinant m into alpha 1 alpha 2. So, eta 1 eta 2 is equal to determinant m into alpha 1 alpha 2 a very important expression we carry forward this one. Now, in order to preserve the integration rules, what we want is integral d eta 1 d eta 2 eta 1 eta 2 if you recall this is equal to this has to be equal to 1 and this is given as integral d alpha 1 and this has to be also equal to integral d alpha 1 d alpha 2 alpha 1 alpha 2 and this implies this implies that because because eta 1 eta 2 from the previous slide eta 1 eta 2 from the previous slide is equal to determinant m alpha 1 alpha 2 it clearly follows that d eta 1 d eta 2 must be equal to determinant m inverse d alpha 1 d alpha 2 d eta 1 d 
another important relationship d eta 1 d eta 2 is equal to determinant m inverse d alpha 1 d alpha 2 and recall eta 1 eta 2 is equal to determinant m alpha 1 alpha 2. Now, consider so we have the following results, we have the following results eta is equal to m alpha, eta bar is equal to n alpha bar, eta bar eta e to the power minus eta bar eta is equal to this whole expansion and that is equal to 1. And we also have d eta 1 d eta 2 is equal to determinant m inverse d alpha 1 d alpha 2 and eta 1 eta 2 is equal to determinant m alpha 1 alpha 2. So, simplifying this what we get is determinant m n inverse because this expression you see this expression is equal to 1. So, if I substitute everything all the etas in terms of their respective alphas in terms of the respective alphas uh, and you can see here e to the power eta bar eta bar is what eta bar is n alpha bar. So, the transpose becomes alpha bar n transpose and uh, eta is equal to m alpha which is here. So, minus eta bar eta is equal to this expression in the superscript of E and uh, all the rest we convert to alpha, alpha, uh, alpha 1 and alpha 2 and then we write them as alpha bar and alpha uh, on parallel lines to eta and eta bar uh, using the respective rules that are here in the blue box and in the next equation here um, the equation below the blue box we get the relationship which is here in the green box. This is a very important relationship. But determinant m n is equal to determinant n n transpose m this gives us n transpose m is equal to a. Uh, if I put n transpose m equal to a I get integral d alpha bar d alpha e to the power minus alpha bar a alpha uh, is equal to determinant a determinant integral d alpha bar d alpha e to the power minus alpha bar a alpha is equal to determinant a. Remember look here this is n transpose m. So, we have substituted n transpose m n transpose m as a and that gives us the relation that is given in the green box here. Now, we move to infinite dimensional Grassmann algebra. We move to infinite dimensional Grassmann algebra. The generators of the infinite dimensional Grassmann algebra and their derivatives appear the, the uh, uh, follow the relationship that is given in the red box here at the bottom of your slide. The quite, quite straightforward generation uh, generalizations of the expressions that are given for the uh, um, for the finite dimensional case anti commutator of C x and C y C x and C y is 0 the left and the right derivatives of C x with respect to C y gives us the delta function direct delta function integral of d C x is equal to 0 integral of C x d C x is equal to 1 absolutely parallel relationships to what we had for the finite dimensional case. Now, the generating functional for the Fermi fields or the Fermi direct fields. We start with the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian for the direct field is given by the expression in the red box. This is quite well known. This is where we start our, uh, our search for the path integral exposition or the path integral expo expression for the generating functional for the Fermi direct fields. We start with the Lagrangian and this Lagrangian is well known from the canonical formulation and the Euler Lagrangian equations. So, this is the Lagrangian for the Fermi direct fields that we obtained from the previous slide and the normalization that we have here if you look carefully is given by z 0 uh, and in the normalization uh, we, we have 
uh, I am sorry, I will come to the normalization, but before the normalization, the normalized generating functional for the direct free direct field can be written using this Lagrangian in the form which is given in the green box at the bottom of your slide. This is remember, this is the generating functional for the free direct field and that is why the suffix 0 is here, 0 n n uh, eta eta bar these are the sources, okay. these are the sources and the Lagrangian is given by the middle term uh, i gamma uh, del, uh, d minus m uh, where gamma are the gamma matrices, uh, direct gamma matrices. Mm, and uh, so, this is the normalized generating function for the free direct fields uh, and uh, remember this is the Lagrangian, the upper equation, the red box equation is the Lagrangian. Using this Lagrangian, using the uh, introducing the various sources and using the anti commuting field functions, we get the expression for the uh, generating functional uh, which is given here for the free field, please note this, no interaction terms are there. And uh, so, this is the generating functional and the normalizer is uh, given in the green box at the bottom of your slide. Please note in the difference between the two is clearly that the sources are absent. So, the normalization is with respect to the uh, sources, uh, uh, setting j equal to 0 gives us the normalizer uh, for the uh, generating functional and uh, eta bar t is the source term for phi x and eta x is the source term for phi bar x. So, from here we will continue in the next lecture. Thank you.